If you've got a Bible, you can be turning to Acts chapter 6. Acts chapter 6 is where we're going to spend our time together this evening. You know, from time to time, I like to take my dog, Gus, for a walk to the park. Uh, it's about a one-mile journey round trip, and we do just about the exact same route every single time. But you wouldn't know it from the looks of him. From the look on his face, it is like he is noticing the world for the first time. Wouldn't it be great if we all lived life every day like that look on our faces? But actually, the other day, I noticed something about two weeks ago. uh, I noticed something new as well on my familiar old route. Uh, I noticed uh, something that maybe it's been there before. Maybe it was something that's just been put up recently. Uh, But one of the houses that we walk by every time that we go on a walk had this wreath on the door, this big, bright, ornate, colorful front door wreath. And in big, bright, ornate, colorful letters, it says, welcome-ish. Welcome-ish. And then right below it, in parentheses, it says, depends on who you are. And you know, come to think of it, I think that's probably the most honest wreath on our block. Welcome-ish depends on who you are. Probably true of most houses, I would guess. But it's also kind of an interesting wreath to notice and read while preaching through the book of James. Because, you know, every time that we gather together on Sundays and on Wednesdays, and even this very night, we put up on the screens in front of the whole church in big, bold, colorful letters, the the word welcome. And I wonder, is it possible that someone could come here and feel instead welcome-ish? Depends on who you are. Could someone walk through our doors and say, welcome-ish, and would we notice? I think that's a hard question, and I think it's a question that the book of James encourages us to ask ourselves. So last week, we spent a little bit of time in the book of James chapter 2, and that is a chapter that is all about faith, right? Right? But it's not just the the faith that we have like in our minds between our ears, but it's faith that is put into action. Uh, That is a chapter that is all about how faith is something to be shown with our lives. So it says in verse 13, so speak and so act. Like that's what we're called to do. And, And somebody may talk about faith, but James says, show me your faith. Show me your faith by what you do. So we spent some time last week talking about that. Like if faith is something to be shown, then, well, we had some questions like, how is it to be shown? And where is it to be shown? And why is it so important that we show our faith? And we talked about showing faith through acts of mercy, remember? Uh, Meeting people's pressing needs. And we talked about how that happens both inside and outside of our assembly, because James says, you know, like some, suppose somebody comes into your assembly and they look one way, and then somebody else comes into the assembly and they look another way, like what are you going to do? How are you going to treat those people? The answer is you're going to show them faith, treating them with dignity, treating them as people in God's image, people with a need to belong and experience God's love in every single way. Well, tonight I kind of want to take that thought and return to it once more, but from just a little bit of a different angle this evening. And as I mentioned, we're not going to be looking at verses from James, but we are going to be looking at a passage that I think really ties in nicely with James chapter 2, and maybe even a little further, illustrates what this faith can be like. And what some of the challenges are, too. So tonight we are going to be in Acts chapter 6. I've invited you already to turn there. I hope this chapter will help us with a different question about showing our faith. Not just how and where and why, but this who question. 
Meaning, who especially needs to experience a James 2 faith from us? And how do we make sure that we show them that? How can we make sure that they feel so much more than welcome-ish in our midst? So keep those questions in mind as we read Acts chapter 6, beginning in verse 1. Now, in these days when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. And I believe it's talking there about the distribution of food to these houses. And the twelve summoned the full number of the disciples and said, It is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. We will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And what they said pleased the whole gathering, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. And these they set before the apostles, and they prayed and laid their hands on them. And it's kind of interesting, it's not mentioned between verse 6 and verse 7, but the major implication is then these guys get to work. Or maybe they get to organizing the work, but the work starts happening then. And because of that, the word of God continued to increase. And the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem. And even a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. Okay, so that's our passage for tonight. Now, what do you think is the lesson that we ought to learn from a passage like this one? We often talk about this as a passage that kind of lays the groundwork for discussion of deacons, and it definitely does. We're not going to focus on that tonight, though. What is this passage saying to us about this faith that must be shown? Because, you know, to me, uh, and maybe you notice this, too, uh, given the way we set this up tonight, to me, this passage reminds me quite a lot of the book of James. And especially, it reminds me of James chapter 2. Uh, so, for example, the issue here in this chapter is what? It's taking care of the widows, right? And the very last verse of the first chapter of James tells us just how important that is. It talks about a true religion being that which looks after the orphan and the widow. And praise God, that is exactly what the church is trying to do here in Acts chapter 6. They are engaged in this effort to take care of the widows. But how are they doing in that effort? I think I'd say they're commendably trying. But there is one problem, right? And what is that problem? Well, there are some rumblings that the church is treating some better than others. In those days, verse 1, a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews. And we'll talk about those two groups of people here in just a minute. For now, let's just focus on the fact that there are some widows, apparently, from this Hellenistic group called the Hellenists who appear to be being neglected, while other widows, the Hebrew widows, apparently are not. So people from a certain segment, from a certain group, from amongst the whole, are being left out. They're not getting the same as someone else. And when I read that, having just been thinking about James, I think about James too. And the first part of that chapter is warning against uh, partiality, or warning against that treating one over another or different than another in the church. And here we have this actual problem happening in the early church. Reminds me a lot of James 2. And what does this problem have to do with? But it has to do with the daily distribution of the food, 
Like the church is actually engaged in this showing their faith in action. They are doing what we talked about last week. They're trying to meet those real and pressing needs. They are not just saying to their brothers and sisters, be warm and well fed. No, they're actually like really trying to do it. And, and so to get back to a more positive thing here with Act 6, like this is just like a really fantastic, commendable effort in spite of the hiccups that we'll talk about to really put faith into action, to really do the very thing that the second half of James chapter 2 is pleading for people to do. And God's church is really trying to do that here. So all of these things kind of remind me of the book of James. You've got caring after the widows. You've got putting your faith into action and meeting these needs. And yet there is this challenge. How do we do that fairly? How do we avoid showing partiality? So the thing I've always wondered about this passage, maybe you have too, is why? Why is it that some are being neglected while others are being taken care of? Why? Why is it that there are rumblings of partiality toward one and, and not the other? Maybe you wonder, like I do, why is that the case? I wish we had more detail on that, right? There's not a whole lot to go off of in this passage, but I will say this. When I read this passage, there's really no, there's really nothing here to make me think that it's intentional. I, I guess I can't know that, but I don't really see that here in the passage. I don't get the sense that they wanted to leave people out. I don't really get the sense that they meant to. We read just a moment ago what this early church is like, and they were just unquestionably generous and going above and beyond to like take care of everybody and take care of one another. Like This was kind of their calling card in the early chapters of Acts. It's one of the things they do best. And then on top of that, when they learn about this problem, they so quickly throw themselves toward correcting it and making it right and trying to do what is good. I look at all these things and I think, well, it sure doesn't look like this was intentional. It sure seems like their motives are quite sincere. And that's comforting, but also you remember that the problem still happened. So why did it happen? I wonder if it's some things like this. First of all, the, the church is really pressed and stressed and strained right now by good things and bad things, really. They're experiencing this amazing growth. So Acts 2, 41, 3,000 people, are, the Lord adds to the church on that day. And then a few verses later, it says, day by day, God is bringing more people more people to Christ. Uh, and then even at the beginning of our chapter tonight, we're reminded that this is still happening. Uh, verse 1 says that the disciples are still increasing in number. And so here's the church. They're trying to take care of one another and show this kind of care for one another. And the numbers just keep growing and growing and growing. I've got to think that's going to be it's going to be tough, right? It's going to be a real challenge. And then there, it's not like all the other things that are challenging just stop while you figure it out. Like at the same time that they're growing and growing and growing and having to figure out how to deal with that, at the same time they're feeling this pressure from outside them. These, these people, uh, the threat of persecution is pressing down on them. There's two stories in the first five chapters of Acts where this pressure, this persecution is just right there on them. There may be more that we don't know about. And it's not just the things outside of them either. There's also these internal conflicts, like any group of people. Uh, Ananias and Sapphira's stories in chapter 5, it's one example of this kind of conflict within the group. People are people, I imagine, they're even more than just that one time. I think about all these things, it leads me to believe that this is not just some rotten motive. This is not bad intentions toward these widows. It's not 
an insincere heart, it sounds a whole lot more like the growing pains of a church with a big heart and big ambitions and big challenges just colliding all at once. And yet somebody does slip through the cracks. And I still have to wonder, why is it this, why is it this particular group? that's being left out. And what can we learn maybe from it? Even if it's not even bad intentions, like even if it's just maybe not noticed. Why this group? So uh, in those days it says, a complaint arose by the Hellenists against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected. My question is why these Hellenists? Why are their widows the ones being neglected? Well, let's talk a little bit about who they are. Maybe that sheds a little light here. So that word Hellenist there, it's a word for, has to do with the Greek world. These are, however, Jewish people. They're not Gentiles. They are Jewish people who have come to believe in Jesus, just like those Hebrew Jewish people who they're worshiping with, have also come from Judaism to believe in Jesus. So they have this much in common. But the difference is these Hellenistic Jews are, maybe they didn't grow up in Jerusalem or Israel. Like maybe they're here now, but maybe they grew up kind of out there somewhere else in some other country in the empire. And so uh, they're a little different. Like maybe they primarily speak Greek while the, Hebrew Jews who become Christians speak Aramaic. And maybe they have some little different cultural quirks and differences, and they come from a little different background. And while the other ones there in Jerusalem are a little bit different than they are, and maybe they're just a little fewer in number here in Jerusalem, surrounded by all the Hebrew Jews. Maybe they just have fewer connections with other people there. So on the one hand, it's like not a different group, but then there are some little differences, and you can imagine how language barriers, different upbringings, and even just normal stuff like that could make it possible for one part of the group to kind of feel like they're a little bit on the outskirts. And that can happen even if a group is really trying to make them welcome. It's just harder, right? And maybe especially with these widows. One of the things that archaeologists have learned, they look at the tombs in Jerusalem, read about their inscriptions and things. Uh, One of the things that they've learned is that it was actually kind of common for these Hellenistic Greek-speaking women who grew up and lived their whole lives like out there in some part of the Roman Empire, when their husbands would pass away and their family would move off, it was kind of common for them to move to Jerusalem in that last stage of their life and live out their last days in Jerusalem and then die and be buried in that city. Like This is something that Hellenistic widows did. We have evidence of this in the tombs in Jerusalem. Kind of makes you wonder if some of these women are like that too. People who live most of their lives away from here, and now they're the newcomer who speaks a different language, grown up their whole life somewhere else, may have not formed those connections yet. You can imagine how if somebody's going to slip off the radar, If somebody's going to slip through the cracks, it's possible for it to be a person like that. And not even because the group doesn't want them there. But in the midst of all those great changes and the great conflicts and the great struggles that are going on in the world from within and without, those people who maybe are just a little bit more on the outer edge of the group, they could be the first to be overlooked. Maybe I'm reading too much into all this. Maybe I am. 
So you can see how that problem wouldn't be far-fetched. You can imagine it. And maybe you can also see how that problem is also not just ancient history either. Like this kind of thing can happen and does happen even now. Like even when the church with the most sincere of hearts really does want to care for and welcome everybody as we should, it's still possible for people who for whatever reason just kind of remain on the outer edge of the group, it's still possible for those people to feel a little overlooked, start to feel a little of that kind of welcome-ish feeling. That's the last thing that the church then or now or there or here would ever want. In our hearts, we do not want that, to make anyone feel anyone less than welcome which is why it's so great to go to this chapter and see what happens next. So back then, Acts chapter 6, they're dealing with this real problem. But then they, when they realize the issue, they make some important changes. The first thing they do is they listen. The problem comes to their ears. They really listen to it. They listen carefully to the people in their congregation, who might be more kind of on the outer edge or feel like that they are, they listen carefully to the people who might not have the loudest voice among them. First, they listen. And then, of course, they act. They act in a James 2 kind of way. They act in a way that strives for fairness They act in a way that strives to meet the pressing need at hand. They act in a way that chooses seven people. Uh, And if I were to put the slide up again, they're all people with Greek names, meaning they're likely to be people who can work well with these Greek-speaking widows who are, are having this need and feeling a little left out. They act in this way that touches the lives of those who might consider themselves less connected to make it clear how much they really belong, how welcome they are in the one church, Christ church. They listen, and then they act. And, you know, the even more beautiful thing is that as they listen to these people who might feel like they're on the edge of the group, And as they learn to bring them in a little closer, what God is doing also is preparing them for the next step in the gospel going to the world. Because right now, it's just here in Jerusalem among the Jews, but now they're starting to learn how to listen to the people that speak Greek and the people who maybe have a little different way of talking and doing things because they grew up over there. And they're learning how to bring them in too. And then, aren't they just so much more prepared for when the next step is, let's bring the gospel to the Gentiles. Let's bring it to all the world. Because they're listening now and they're, they're learning to bring in those on the outer edges of their own group. They're actually learning things that will help them to reach beyond it, too. And maybe those people who feel like they're on the outside now, maybe they're actually the people best suited to help answer the next door, the next opportunity, which seems to be what happens here. Verse 7, the word of God continued to increase. And the number of disciples multiplied greatly. The doors kept opening. And the church kept reaching further. I don't know about you, but I, today I, I know that I can learn from the example of this great church in, in Acts chapter 6. I take comfort in the fact that even those early Christians, they had their struggles and their hiccups and their growing pains along the way. I'm so glad that I can learn from the problems they had. 
like them. I know that I can get distracted by the work at hand, maybe the challenges at hand, maybe other things too. And even with a sincere heart, there may be times when I don't open my ears like I should to people whose voices might not be as loud. Maybe I need to learn from this chapter in that way. Maybe I need to learn from the growing pains and the setbacks. But maybe also, you know, we can learn from this great response that God can do powerful things when we learn to listen and listen to our brothers and sisters. And God can do powerful things when we put our faith into action and help everybody to know that they belong. He can even be preparing us for that next step for that reaching out a little bit further as his word and his love reaches more and more. Well, maybe tonight you're challenged by this message too. Maybe for some of us, those two words of action, listen and act, well, they could apply to us in many ways. At its foundation, our response to the gospel is like that. Faith comes by hearing hearing the word of God, and when we listen to it and we realize its call in our lives, the power of that is when we respond to it. When we respond to that message and we're baptized in his name and raised up again, that's where the power lies. So we offer an invitation this evening, and it's an invitation to respond to this powerful word of God. However you may be challenged tonight, we offer this moment to respond while we stand, while we sing.